he created me inside my, my mother's. Yeah. And he formed me, you know, for a for a purpose and for a for a reason. And he made me into his masterpiece. Well, welcome to the True Man Podcast with Mike Van Pelt. This is an invitation to radical reconstruction of a man's masculine heart and soul in a place of safe community where we dare to ask questions deep-seated inside a man and explore ways to help you become a better man, a better dad, and a better spouse. Well, I love hearing other people's story. And I, I just think you draw so much information from a person, how they've lived their life. And in almost every case, I've found they've had to overcome the odds of something at some point in their life. And what I found is this, it's not a matter of if you're going to have challenges in your life, it's a matter of when. And for some people like my guest today, well, they're born with challenges right out of the gate. Now, how you accept those challenges in many times, uh, in many cases, is a product of your environment, the people you're around, and your attitude. So today's guest is an inspiration to say the least. And I think you're going to love his story. So welcome to the podcast, Dorsey Ross. Now, Dorsey was born in January of 1977. He's a January baby, just like me. And he was born with a congenital disability known as Apert syndrome. And I'm going to let him share with us what that is in a minute. But for the purposes of introduction, Dorsey has transitioned this disability. I don't think there's any doubt into overcoming anything that gets in his way. So Dorsey leads uh, Dorsey Ross Ministries, and he's traveled all over the country speaking and sharing his testimony, encouraging people that anything is possible through God. So Dorsey, welcome to the True Man Podcast. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate you having me. <laughs> Man, that was a mouthful right there, I think. So listen, I am really looking forward to hearing your story today. So, so tell us how it all started. You were, obviously you were, you, as I mentioned in the intro, you were born, uh, with this, with this disability and, um, you know, that can be difficult in a childhood. So talk about that and how you were able to maneuver around and and the support system that they had in place. Right. Well, like you said, I was born in 1977. And, you know, unlike today, they didn't have the, you know, the testing and the technology like they do today to, you know, determine the the health of the baby and, yeah. you know, you know, you know, how, how, how well it's growing and how well the baby, you know, progressing in, in the room. Yeah. And I was a supply of the family, uh, my family. I, you know, was later on in, in uh, my parents were later on in age when they, when my mom had me, my mom was 41 and my dad was 45 and he, you know, started to gain weight and he said, well, you know, I'm up in age, you know, I don't know what's going on here. Let me go and get checked out. And the doctor said, well, you know, you're fine, you're healthy, but you do have a baby, you know, growing inside of you. And, you know, about eight months later, my mom, you know, my dad went to a hospital and and the doctors, you know, and I was born and the doctors rushed me off to Renome. And normally, you know, most babies are able to be held by the parents and yeah. able to be seen by the parents, you know, probably a few minutes after they're born. And my parents, you know, didn't have that opportunity. And, you know, several uh, several minutes, maybe hours later, the doctors, you know, came back into the room and explained to my parents that, as you said, I was born with a congenital disability called aplet syndrome. Now, what that is, is it's a deformity of the face and the hands. And when I was born, my forehead was uh, pushed outward. My eyes and nose were pushed back in my head, and my fingers and toes 
refused to get them. I mean, I had no individual movement of them. Mm. And one of the other things was the fact that I had no school opening or no short spot to allow my brain to grow and allow it to function normally. And the doctor said, because of the uh, skull, not skull being closed already and not having any room for my brain to grow, they said, you know, we think that Dorsey will eventually become brain dead and we don't mm-hmm. think he'll survive. And my, they would get, my parents were given the option to sign papers and to put me into a institution as a newborn baby. And my parents said, you know, right away, they said, well, you know, we can't do that. You know, we believe in God and we believe in faith and we believe that, you know, God will do something with this baby. Yeah. And they decided to take me home and see what, God was going to do with the child, with, with me. And they had heard from a nurse in the hospital where I was born. I was born in, in New York, uh, Queens, New York. I was born and bred in, in New York most of my life. And they had heard from a nurse in the hospital that doctors at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City were doing operations on babies like myself and they said well you know why don't you take him now and see what the doctors can tell you and the doctor said well you know at the other hospital said well you know we can operate on your son we can open his skull and you know we can see what will happen no we don't you know they probably said, well, we don't know, you know, if he'll survive, yeah. how long he'll survive. And at six weeks, I had my first of many operations to open the skull and to allow my brain to grow and allow it to function normally. And from about five, about six weeks to about five years old, I had about 10 operations or you know some of them lasting up to probably 10 hours at a time maybe more and I'm 45 now and over my lifetime up until about 17 16 17 years old I had about 68 operations oh my god all you know in that in that time span what is that like I mean is I I I, know it do you get just used to the process. I mean, that that's so extensive. I mean, I don't even know how to ask. It's like, what is it? What is it like to go through that many surgeries? I think as I got older, I started to realize, I mean, as I got older, you know, especially in my beginning of my teenage years and, you know, in that time span, I think my parents gave me more, um, more power, if you want to call it that, to make the decisions on my own. Oh, wow. Of what a, whether I want to have, you know, another surgery or if I want to have, you know, do, do you know, have any more of the surgeries. And I think I started to understand and realize that one, it was, more of a, you know, it was helping me in, in health, in my health, you know, to be able to, especially my, my nose and my, my mouth and everything, helping me to breathe better on right. my own, be able to, you know, eat better, you know, because I had to, you know, have my gore wired a few times and, um, you know, to be able to, you know, maybe eat better and do better. And, you know, you know, as I said, you know, giving me more of a opportunity to make the decisions yeah. on my own. And I, I, you know, I, I also realized it was helping me to even 
to even look better, you know, to be able to, you know, look, you know, quote unquote, you know, more like a, you know, I don't want to use the word normal, but look more, you know, not who, if, if that, sure. yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make, yeah. So what was it like growing up? Obviously, <laughs> kids are pretty good at bullying. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're pretty good to pick on somebody, uh, you know, at, e- even me. I, I wore, started wearing glasses when I was five, so I got picked on for that. Uh, what, what, was it, what was it like growing up and, and going to school in a situation where, you know, you looked a little different than everybody else? Yeah, well, I actually went to a, I started at five years old, and from five years old till I, when I was 19 and I graduated high school, um, that whole time, I was in a school for people with disabilities. Mm. And it was all, you know, types of, it, of uh, disabilities, all, you know, varying types. And in that school, I mean, even that on the outside world, which I'll get to in a minute, but even in a school for people with disabilities, you wouldn't think it would happen. You wouldn't think it would come about. But even in that school, you know, I was teased make fun of, you know, mocked and picked on. And, you know, even on the outside world, you know, the same thing happened basically. Yeah. And I would get, you know, names like, you know, monster and and freak. Even a, even as an adult, you know, there are times when, you know, people would ask me, you know, or say to me, you know, and there is a lot of this, you know, especially what I'm about to say happened over the over the computer, you know, and it was on a Christian dating site, even, um, you know, where people would say to me, you look weird, you know, you look, you know, you look different, you know, well, I know I look different. Thank you so much. Uh, at least you can laugh about it. I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes I laugh, sometimes I'm like, you know, yeah, I get upset, you know, at times. Well, people are mean, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're living in, uh, you know, it used to be we talked about kids being bullies. Now, uh, it, it, heck, that's in the adult world. I mean, adult adults are equally as bad as as some of the kids, in my opinion. Yeah. So you know, it, it happens, you know, and it, you know it. Sometimes, and I understand when it's younger kids, you know, they may not sure. fully understand, you know, they may, they may have the, you know, the, um, they may not have the understanding of why I look different and why, you know, why I look the way I look. But just to give you a sweet example of something that happened this past Sunday at my church, um, sometimes, you know, Especially when I was younger, you know, you, you know the little kids, you know, I, you know, look at them and they would start coming up to me and they like they run away, you know. Yeah. And but now this little girl that, at my church where I attend, she came up to me, and said, you know, waving. She's like two, maybe three years old, and her mother, you know, came up behind her, you know, gave it to me, as, and I was, I was holding her. I was holding it for like a good, a good 10 minutes. Yeah. And I tried to put it down. He's like, you know, holding on for like dear life, you know, and that, you know, I was just like beaming from ear to ear because, you know, you don't, you don't expect that sometimes, you know, I look back on my life and I remember all the times that, you know, people would be mean and people would be upset. And, you know, that's one, just one of the moments that I can highlight now and say, hey, here's an example of where that didn't happen. Well, how did, how did you, how, I mean, you seem like you've got a fantastic attitude about this. I got to say, I mean, how do, how do you overcome all that bullying, all that stupidity, yeah. that people saying stuff to you? How do you overcome that and just, I don't know, put it in a, box somewhere and just move on and have a positive attitude 
Yeah, well, I think that it's definitely my support system. You know, my support system growing up was definitely my my parents. Yeah. Um, you know, they they supported me a hundred percent. They treated me as someone even without a disability. You know, they allowed me to figure out for myself what I could and could not do. And really couldn't wasn't very much. And I think treating me as someone without a disability really helped. You know, they didn't, you know, they didn't treat me any any differently and they didn't, you know, I don't know how to say it, but they didn't, you know, they didn't put me in the box. And yeah. They, you know, they didn't put me in the box. What do, you, they, what do you think it was about your parents that, that uh, caused them to raise you that way? That's a, you know, that's a great question. I guess it was, maybe it was possible it was their faith. Yeah. Their faith in God that said, hey, you know what? God gave us the child and God is allowing us to keep the child and we'll just, you know, raise him the way that we, you know, that God wants us to raise him. And yeah. this is, you know, this is the way that God wants us to raise him is to, as a, as a normal, as a normal child. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, they must have had incredible faith. How did that that and obviously it's 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 played a, a part in your development. I mean, what is what is your faith? Uh, what has that been like for you? I mean, it, obviously you've you've leaned on that a lot over oh, the yeah, years. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. talk about your your faith and how you've been able to lean on 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 God in these in some of these challenging times. Yeah, I, I grew up, you know, I grew up in the church, you know, from birth until, you know, until now. And I gave my life, you know, to Christ at the age of 13. Mm. And, you know, every time I went into the hospital, you know, my mom and I, before going into the operating room, and even sometimes in the operating room, my mom would sometimes have to come in with me just to, you know, calm me down and have that, you know, the blessing, my mom being the blessing of a peace and, you know, just to calm me down and calm, you know, my fears and my anxiety down that I had about that particular operation and the particular procedure that I was dealing with. And, you know, it was just, you know, just trusting him that, you know, yeah. he would take care of me and that he would protect me in those operations, in those difficulties. And, you know, with the bullying and everything, I just had to learn that, you know, he, as, as he does all of us, he created me, he created me inside you know, my mother's body. He created me inside my, my mother's. Yeah. And he formed me, you know, for a, for a purpose and for a, for a reason. And he made me into his masterpiece. Oh, that's, and a masterpiece you are. So let's talk about this. I, I love this too. Got so many different areas to talk about here, but not only did you get through high school, you decided, man, I'm going to go to, I'm going to hit the college trail. <laughs> talk about that. Yeah. Um, well, in the, in the, before going on to college, um, you know, I had to have a meeting, as I said, because I went to a school for people with disabilities. I had yeah. to have a meeting to, to talk about and to, discuss, you know, what I would do after high school, you know, would I go home and get a, get a job or would I, you know, what, you know, whatever the options were and what are the discussion was. And obviously one of the discussions was the fact that I wanted to go on to college and I wanted to see what that would be like. And in this meeting, my high school history teacher was there and he was asked, 
you know, do you think that Dorsey will be able to make it in college? And he said, no, I don't think that Dorsey will be able to make it in college. I don't think he has the ability to make it in college. And and to a degree, that may have been true because, you know, in in elementary school and even in high school, I I struggled. You know, I didn't do yeah. well on tests. I didn't do well on certain exams and, you know, subjects and whatnot. And, but regardless of that, I wanted to go on and see what, you know, would happen, see what would take place. And my parents, again, my parents were 100% supportive of that. And they said, you know, my mom was then in, in this meeting. She said, well, if Dorsey, if Dorsey thinks he can make it, he will. And before, I love that. I love your mom. <laughs> <laughs> before going on to college, I had asked her one day. She was in the living room. I was in the in. Uh, she was in the kitchen. I was in the living room. And I said to her, I said, how long do you think it will take me to finish college? And for whatever reason, she said, I don't care if it takes you 10 years as long as you finish. Well, it took me four years to do a two-year community college. And I decided after that, even after dealing with four years of, of college, I decided to do even brutalize myself a little more with education and go on to Bible college. And it took me another five years to do a four-year degree in Bible college so for a total of nine years. Now, whether my mom saying 10 years was, you know, was a, was a fluke or a wild guess, I have no idea, but she wasn't, she wasn't that far off. Well, I just love the fact that you had the wherewithal to go for it. Uh, you know, because a lot of people with fewer challenges uh, have a lot of excuses and you had none. Well, you had every reason to have excuses, but you, but you went for it anyway. Right. How do you feel like, all that, that, that education, you know, that, that nine years, how, how does that catapult you to where you're at today? Well, I, I actually wanted, to, I actually, I'm not, well, I, I'm not saying I don't use the education, especially in the Bible. Well, yeah. I don't use that, <laughs> but, but I went for a youth pastoring degree and the, I never became a youth pastor. And it wasn't because I didn't want to or because I didn't, you know, want to do that. It's just because the doors in different, you know, interviews, yeah. you know, before I graduated and even after I graduated, the different interviews that I went on just kept closing. And, you know, I would never get a second, you know, second call back from those youth pastors or... Now I got I got to tell you Dorsey now that's interesting to me because <clears throat> aren't churches supposed to be welcoming of anybody? Yeah, they are. Should we just leave it at that and move on? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we should leave it at that and move on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. We're moving on. So so you didn't become a youth pastor. So how did you transition to everything? Well, we'll go back to when I was in youth ministry for uh, um for well you when I was in my youth group for a minute. And when I was about probably 17, 18, when I was a youth leader, maybe even a little older at the time, I had somebody say to me, you know, who was a youth leader, youth leader as well, say to me. Dorsey, I see you, and you, this is even before I even thought about what I'm doing now. Um, say to me, Dorsey, I see you traveling around the country sharing your story. Mm. 
And, you know, sometimes, you know, when people say, you know, certain things to us like that and whatnot, we, you know, our response, my response at least, was, was probably, okay, thank you very much. That's very kind of you to say. Right, right. right. And, you know, growing up, I had a, I still do it to a degree. You know, some people don't, some people, most people say to me, they don't hear it or they, you know, can understand me pretty well. But growing up, I had a speech impediment. And, you know, you know, a lot of people want to understand what I say, want to understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. Some people even today, you know, especially when I'm making cold calls to get, you know, speaking engagement still misunderstand my name. Like you said earlier, you know, you, at least my name you could, you could pronounce. <laughs> yeah. Some people I'll get on the phone with and they'll be like, your name's Dorothy? I'm like, no, Dorothy. And they'll be like, what of it? D O R S and Sam E Y. <laughs> and, you know, so, so, you know, traveling around the country sharing my story was not even on my radar. <laughs> and I don't even think it was in, in Bible college that was on my radar. Yeah. So when I, you know, when I graduated, I came back home, I started going to, a new church when I was back home in New York. And one of the people, one of the youth leaders, or the youth pastor at the time, and he still is, was somebody I actually met when I was in Bible college. And so I connected with him. I connected with the youth, with the um, senior pastor at the time, who still is. And they, you know, encouraged me. They supported me in my, um, you know, dreams of becoming, doing something in ministry. And they gave me the opportunity to share my story at, at an outreach event in 2006 called Summerfest. And when I, when I, you know, during that time, I was playing, you know, still playing about what God had for me and what God wanted me to do. And I just felt in my heart and just felt like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, send this out with a packet that we had that they put together and send this out and see what, you know, I would do with it. And that's pretty much how, you know, those who work ministries got started in, in June of that year, or June of 2007, rather, I started traveling around sharing my story. And here we are, you know, 15, almost 16 years later. So what has that journey been like now to, to be out telling your story and sharing your story? And, and how do you, how have you been able to impact people? Cause I presume that's, that, that's been kind of the, 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 the driving force, right. Is your ability to impact people to, um, as your book is called overcome the odds. Right. Yeah. Overcome. Yeah. It's definitely impacting, you know, many, many people, you know, I get all the time. I get people coming up to me after, after the service saying, you know, thank you very much for coming. Your story definitely has impacted my life and, you know, encouraged me and, inspired me in, in my own life, in my own journey as well. But what has it done for you? You know, I mean, yeah. the, your story is incredible. I can definitely see where people would be inspired by it. What is, what is being able to go out and tell your own story done for you? I think it encourages me, you know, as well. Just yeah. because it, it, you know, allowing me to see that hey, I'm in, I'm impacting yeah. other people. I'm I'm inspiring and encouraging other people because of what I've been through, because of what I've had to overcome in my own life. You know, yeah. not, you know. Thankfully, and I I don't think it ever would. And if it did, I would allow somebody to to you know pop my bubble or pop, you know, but I don't, it hasn't, you know, what I've 
what I'm doing hasn't given me, you know, a big ego or a big, you know, head or anything, anything like that. Well, listen, I, I am so um, glad that you've been able to come on and share, share with us today. And I, I just want to say, and again, you know, some of this will, information we'll put in the, we'll put in the uh, um, show notes, but, and I, I just mentioned that you, you also, of all the things that you've done, you've written a book called Overcomer, Discovering God's Plan Against All the Odds. Now, you know, is there, is there anything that you'd like to tell us about that, that book? Yeah, it, you know, again, my autobiography, it, my story from, from birth until um, my, my adult life, you know, from my adult life and what I've had to deal with and what I've had to go through in my adult life. Most of it, you know, I share in, in, my, in, my, in my story when I go out and speak. Yeah. And... You know, a lot of, you know, some people will just, who've heard me speak will just buy a copy either for themselves yeah. or they'll buy a copy for someone else that they know needs to hear, you know, my story. What is the number one, I want to get this in before we wrap up today. What is the number one piece of advice you offer people to overcome challenges in their life? Yeah, I, you know, I always say this, and I think it's true. And I always just say, you know, don't give up. You know, mm. don't give up and don't don't quit. You know, if you're facing a, a challenge today or tomorrow, or you know, as you said, you know, that some, you know, you said earlier, you know, we'll we'll face it eventually. You know, we'll face a a challenge and a trial mm. eventually. And I'll just say, you know, don't don't give up and and don't you know don't quit. You know, that's that's the biggest thing that I would say. Yeah, it seems so simple, doesn't it? But boy, is there so much power behind giving that advice, I think. So so Dorsey, tell everybody again, we'll put this in the short notes. How can they get a hold? Uh uh, how can they find you and how can they get a hold of the book? Yeah, the biggest way to get a hold of me is through my website. It's www.dorseyross ministriesies.com and you'll also find a link uh, to my book on there as well and if you buy the, um, the book directly on my website you know I'll get a notification email notification on there and I'll also autograph the book for you as well there you go. Dorsey will autograph the book for you. I mean, how can you, how, how can you not go grab that book? Dorsey, listen, I, I'm, I'm so glad we were able to meet and have you on the show so that you could tell your story about o- overcoming your situation. I think it's so critical. I think that for people to hear these types of stories, I, I think, you know, w- with, uh, uh, some of the stuff that's been in the news lately, you know, around R- Roe v. Wade and people giving up babies and, and all this stuff. And, and, um, and, and I'm just so proud of your parents that they raise you the way that they raise you and that we, you know, had this opportunity to, to talk today. So I th- I'm grateful that, uh, that you were able to be on the true man podcast with me. Well, thank you for having me again. I appreciate it. You bet. All right, Dorsey. Thanks uh, again for being on the show and take care. All right. You too.